Hello and welcome. I'm Erin Cuthbert, footballer for Chelsea and the Scotland national team, and you're listening to the Blue Day podcast. Fellow Chelsea supporters, here at the Blue Day podcast, I am delighted to welcome our guest on the show today. He made 32 appearances for the club, scoring eight goals. He played alongside the likes of Gianfranco Zola, Graham Lasso, and Ida Good Johnson. Here is Colton Cole. Colton, welcome to the show. How, how are we? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? I'm uh, I'm uh, happy to be here, happy to be invited. To, um, I've been on many West Ham podcasts, but I've never been on a, a Chelsea one before, so it should be very interesting. Brilliant. We're glad that we are the first, and most most definitely. So we're, we're going to talk about, obviously, your time as a, a as a young footballer, rather than, obviously, when you sort of reached your peak. But before we talk about, obviously, your time as a footballer, I want to sort of, if you can, take us back to that moment where you decided you wanted to become a professional footballer. What was the what was that moment for you that twigged to say this is what you wanted to be? Um, it was that time when um, I've got to say um, when my 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 uncle used to take me to football Sunday League over in uh, CB United over in Hounslow, um, and it was really um, an eye opening experience because I just saw how my uncle was treated by his other um, his other peers, his other teammates. And he was treated like a king because he was so good. Um, I didn't realise how good he was until somebody told me how good he actually was uh, at playing the game. And um, I said, you know what, I want a bit of that. I just remember being in a um, at the bar after the game, after he'd played, and um, everyone trying to buy him a drink um, and giving him a pat on the back. I just remember watching him. And then even I was half a celebrity in that bar as well because... <laughs> Um, everyone wanted to just buy me an orange juice or a fan or, or whatever it was at the time. Um, and uh, I just remember always getting these KP peanuts um, for free. No one, I never had to pay for anything. So um, it's one of those ones where I thought my 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 my, my uncle was a superstar in his own right in that area in that area of his life because he was so good at it. So I was thinking, you know what, I want a bit of that. <laughs> Obviously, apart from your uncle, who were your idols growing up as a kid? Um, my idols growing up as a kid. Um, I just, do you know what? For me, it was one of those ones where I felt anyone that looked like me, as in being black um, and making that that level, was a, a hero of mine. I used to love Ian Wright, Les Ferdinand, right? Um, but also, I used to love the. I used to love players um, that had great skills. And um, it was probably people like um, uh, Matt Letizia, and who was a great striker at the time as well, Alan Shearer. Andy Cole was a great hero of mine as well. Uh, so I admired a lot of people. I didn't have an idol. I used to love Johnny Barnes, obviously. Um, I used to love... One other player I used to love um, was Keith Gillespie because the way he just used to run down the wing and then cross it in. With that. I used to love these type of players. They call them the Barkley Cart, the Barkley Premier League players now. Do you know what I mean? Both, that's the era that I I grew up in, and um, yeah, that was there was football like no other in those in those times. But there was brilliant players back then, and um, I just I just took a bit out of everybody's leaf. Obviously, I loved playing with Gianfranco Zola, Marcel Desailly. But when you look from afar, when I was growing up, I always wanted to be on the stage where I could see myself playing with these superstars that I could see on the TV. I used to love of watching um, 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 the Italian football, Football Italia, on, uh, I think it was on Channel 4 back in the day. And um, I remember seeing I remember seeing players like Viali, Rude Hullet, all these players. And then eventually they came to Chelsea. So I was, I was a bit like miffed that they, I was going to be in and around it um, at some stage of my career when I was a YT. So it was a really good opportunity for me to see them first class in training, the first hand in training, and see what they really do to make them so great. Speaking of Chelsea, you had come through the youth ranks at the club. What are your best memories about coming through the club 
going up from under 18s to the first team at that time? Um, my best memories has got to be the time when, um, when when I actually got given a contract. Um, so obviously, when I was um, youth, well, playing for my Sunday league side, Walpole Wanderers, um, obviously Chelsea came in, a guy called Bob Osborne scouted me. He was actually the kit man at the time of the first team and um, he scouted me to get into the into Chelsea at the time and um, I got in, done really well, got got what I needed to get out of the game, started building my, my reputation about being a goal scorer. I actually wasn't, um, um, I don't think I was uh, seen as a striker when I first came. I was a midfielder when I first joined and then I um, had a few games at the back. Then I just, um, but I was still a goal scoring um, player. Um, I could play football, and that was the main thing. Um, I was I was speaking to Ted Dell not so long ago on Talksport, and he was saying that he didn't know where they didn't know where to put me, what position to put me. But all they knew is that I was a damn good footballer. So that was um, one thing, and then I was able to be moulded into a striker. That's why you don't probably see the predatory predatory instincts of a striker that I should have. But because I'm a manufactured striker, because I could play all kinds of positions, but um, I think the striker role at that time when I was coming through the ranks um, suited me. So my, my main memories is obviously, um, actually, I wouldn't even say it was a good memory, but I'll say a bad memory was playing for the um, in the FA Cup under 19s um, at the bridge. And um, I think it was Claudio Ranieri's first game to a run his eye over the youth team and we got battered 7-1 um, so it wasn't a great time to, to advertise yourself to someone like Claudio Ranieri walking through the door and I remember he said to somebody that there was no talent in that team that he watched um, but i.e. then obviously we as a few players that got into his first team in the end but um, it was um, a strange period but one that I really wanted to prove him wrong that what he saw that day was not going to be the end of it you know so that I really really wanted to prove him um, wrong that there are t there was talent at, at Chelsea um, and we did really have um, a lot of good players at the time we had Leon Knight at the time Courtney Pitt um, we had Andy Ross who's um, down at the club at the moment obviously as a coach and um, we had some good players at that at that time um, Alexis Nicolas he got a, he got a um, he got into the first team for a few games. Um, we had Joe Keenan. Um, so we had we had some good players back then. Uh, Reece Evans, I think I remember, was in. Lenny Pidgeley, obviously. Um, so we had some... And the, the thing about it, Robert Hoof, I, I was talking to him about um, coming through the ranks in the earlier days. Seb Sebastian Kanaisal as well. It was um, it was a really um, a great unit. We had a great bunch of lads and it's good to keep in contact with them till, till this day as well, some of them. So... Yeah, um, those are my fond memories of being at the club. But yeah, obviously that 7-1 drumming wasn't great. <laughs> not a good show and definitely not. However, yeah. you would make your debut for Chelsea, albeit from the bench against Everton. When did you know that you was going to be involved in the first team? And what was your emotions about being featured at Chelsea coming on at, at, towards the home fans? Um, for me, it was it was an amazing reward for um, a stellar season. Um, I've got to say, it was I, I'd scored so many goals that that year, um, and at all levels. I think I was in, under nineteen. I was I was scoring at will. Reserve, reserve team. I was scoring at will, um, and it wasn't just about my scoring as well. It was my whole rounded game, um, bringing bringing others into play, being that being that big man up front that's got a little bit of skill, can run in behind, can hold up the ball. Um, and my uncle always said to me, listen, there's a load of players in this in this game that can score goals probably more than you even. Um, so you've got to bring something else a little bit different. Um, so your hold up play has got to be bang on. Um, try and practice that as much as you can. So I was, that's the um, angle I was getting in to that squad with. Um, and then obviously you had Claudio Ranieri that, um, was a big champ, um, champion and champion my name um, to the extent of him actually giving me um, a run out. Steve, I think Steve Clark at the time as well was um, massive in that as well because he was actually pushing my name forward, saying, "Listen, you need to take a look at this lad. He's he's doing really well." Um, at that time as well, I 
think um, Leon Knight was on loan somewhere. Um, so it gave me a little bit of space to go and um, prove myself in the first team and try and get some minutes. Um, and yeah, it, it worked out in the end. Uh, I, 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 w I stayed in around the first team. So I made my debut. The Everton game was amazing because I came on for Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank, who was the king of the bridge at the time. And um, it was uh, quite some feet actually running out on that on that pitch in front of all those uh, low fans and then actually applauding me. I've never had that in my life, um, having that um, admiration and, and people actually seeing a homegrown talent coming onto the pitch. It was a great feeling. Um, and it was just that because I, I grew up in Brentford, it, it just made that made it even better because it's just my local, basically my local team. Um, and I just knew that I, I belonged somewhere and I was a, a, a product of the, the academy and uh, everybody was proud of me making my debut. Um, coming from the youth, you know, so it was a, it was an amazing privilege to be around that at the time. And um, looking back, um, I always that's why I'm in football now because I want players to always feel that 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 graduation um, feeling because there's nothing like it. It's unbelievable going out, getting rewarded for some of your hard work that you've had all that season, all the way up, and it's great for your parents as well to see how far you've come and, and and all the sacrifices they've made to make you see you make that make that debut. So it's a it was very good for me. You mentioned Claudio Ranieri. What was he like as a coach for you? Um so for me Claudio was a definitely um a one off. Um he he didn't really speak great English um but uh, as a coach, he knew what he wanted. He knew what he wanted to go after. Um, and I felt that it was my first ever first team coach that I've had to encounter. And um, he was very supportive. Um, he, he, he put an arm around me when he needed to. Um, he chastised me when he needed to. Um, so he really wanted me to go and do well. Um, and the thing about Claudio, I would say, is that he was, um, he was a very... Flamboyant man in his character, um, but he knew how to get the job done, and 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 he knew that I was one of those players that needed a, a little bit of extra push sometimes. As as you can tell, he um, came out and said, um, "Depends what Carlton Cole turns up. It could be the, the the young lion or it could be the rabbit." Um, so he was really putting me in into this category where if I was if I fancied it that day, I could I could beat the world. But if I didn't, I'd be a really bad player and you wouldn't even think I knew how to kick off football. You would end up scoring your first goal for the club against Middlesbrough. That must have been a pleasing moment for you to get off the mark so early during your time in, with the first team. Yeah, um, well, that was uh, that came about quite... Uh, it came about... I didn't realise I was going to be starting that game. Um, I think there was an injury to, I think it was, I think it was to Jimmy Floyd or, no, it was Idega Johnson. In the, yeah, Idega Johnson came off um, during the warm-up or he wasn't allowed to start the game on and it was Jimmy that had to pull out. It was one of the two. But I was in the dressing room anyway and um, I was just there listening to my Walkman as you do um, and it was someone just rushed in and says, Cole, come on, mate, you're going you to go and warm up, you're starting. I was like, what? What am I doing here? Like, I, <laughs> me, I'm starting a Premier League game for Chelsea. What have I got myself into? Do I actually want to be a footballer now? Because <laughs> now it's getting, um, <laughs> it's actually getting real. Uh, but my talent's got me this far, so I just thought, you know what? Let me go and get changed. Let me go and have a run out and let's have a go, eh? Um, so, when, obviously, when you're lining up with um, these, all these superstars on the pitch, all these legends that you've been watching all your life on the TV, um, walking out and actually being a part of that and actually being probably the star of the show because I was probably the youngest on the pitch um, and people were actually saying, who's this young boy that's coming through the ranks? So everyone wanted to know what was going on. It's not like back in the day when people know about these young players because they've got um, Instagram, they've got all of these things. This is like right. new kid on the block. I just made my debut last week. Now you've got 
this boy is starting a game for Chelsea, um, which you can't be a monk to be starting a game for at that level. Um, so it was everyone wanted to see how good I was, and, and and I was put to the test. So I couldn't have I couldn't have got to a better start. Got off to a better start. You got to understand when you um you're playing with these superstars, there's a level of expe- level of expectancy of you just not just going out, going out there having a go. You've got to keep to the rules. You've got to keep to the tactics. You've got all these other things that you've got to think about. And then you think about yourself. Now, when you do that, and then and and obviously when you go out and then you your your first cross comes and meets your head and it comes off the crossbar and goes in, it's um it's a feeling that you can never ever rep- replicate ever again in your life. Um, that first goal that you score in the Premier League for your club, it's um you just can't you just can't imagine because you know you know this ain't this ain't normal. <laughs> this is not normal. <laughs> this is not a normal thing to do especially you're away from home you're playing against the likes of Paul Lintz and, and and other characters in that team where I felt I can't believe I'm on the same pitch with these guys let alone scoring and being the main man um, and it's just um, you can't describe the feeling and that's why I, always, I do my job now because I'm just always trying to replicate that in another way. So obviously I've got kids now and I want them to feel the same thing as well. Um, but that feeling what I, I, I had that time and that when I was celebrating, I just don't know what to do. I couldn't I didn't know what to do with myself. Um when you got Frank Lampard on the pitch, the people you look up to, John Terry, all these superstars on the pitch, Manu Petit, the Sai, all of them, Bolo Zenden, all of these great players that's on the pitch, and obviously it's Van Kozola celebrating with you to, that you had your first goal Mario Stanic all these players just yeah. like um, legends of the game and they're s- celebrating and so happy for you uh, Mario Melchior then you've got all these other players and you've <laughs> even got um, players players like that you wouldn't even think of like um, and I'm thinking like Galas all these players that are just stalwarts in football you know and um, I was just so happy to be around players like that and uh, they were there for me when I first scored my first goal and there's not a lot of players that can say that definitely not the summer of 2002 did you have conversations with Claudio about what he had planned for you because obviously you made a couple of appearances season prior and with the likes of Good Johnson and Hasselbank and even Zola being the senior strikers, did Claudio sort of talk to you privately and sort of say what he had planned for you for the forthcoming season? Um, yeah, so uh, we um, obviously, because of that, that season, we'd obviously just got into the uh, Champions League and um, and it was very important that we did, to be honest. Um, but this up and coming season, I knew that I might have been a, a part of what was going to be going forward um, for the club at that time because I knew that at that time we needed to um, we needed to secure Champions League football um, just financially for the club mm. because it was really um, important because it wasn't a good way at the time. So I knew I might have had to, and because I'm homegrown, so we were planning ahead. Um, that I I got told by my agent anyway that I was a big plan. Um, I was I was planning to be around that that the first team and um, growing and I'm staking a claim for a first team start and head of obviously and competing um, with the likes of either Jimmy um, Franco and uh, maybe bring in a few more but I was a, I was a big part of the the process and um, it was it was a little bit disheartening when obviously the takeover happened for me um, because I was obviously. I obviously had to go and play games, but I wasn't going to get the game time um, at my home, so which was a bit disappointing. But the plan was initially for me to stay at the club um, and, and and progress and and the club look after me, get to the next level um, and get the experience I needed. A couple of games I did want to talk about of the that season where it was the o two o three season. The first game I believe we was away to Charlton in the Premier League, you would come off the bench and score the crucial equaliser before Lampard scored the winner. What was the expectations amongst that team 
going into the season? Was it a case of we've got the capabilities to get into the Champions League for next season or was it something beyond that? Um, I think it was just to finish as high up as possible. Um, it was to get into the Champions League, definitely, because we needed the money, as I say. That yeah. season was, was a difficult season um, off the field. Um, we're playing well on it, don't get me wrong, but um, we was it was very important. And it was a sti- it was stiff competition um, at the time. Um, obviously, you had Manchester United, Arsenal, Liverpool, and we had to... And then we, and then Chelsea, obviously, and then I think there was one other that was competing with uh, for that full spot. But um, it was very important; it was imperative that we got into the Champions League. So when these things come on, and I came on that that game at Charlton, and I obviously came on, and I was buzzing, I was buzzing to be there. Come on, score the goal, and um, I was part of the second goal. Um, the the winner is the winner as well. Was it the equaliser? I can't remember, but I think it was the winner with um, Frank Lampard. Um, it that was a special moment, not just for me. That showed that I was a team player. It wasn't just about me coming off the bench and trying to get a goal for myself. I could do other things as well, um, stretch the game, and um, be a massive nuisance to the opposition. And um, the season after that, I went on loan to Charlton. Um, I think because of that game, because um, I thought obviously Alan Kirbishley felt like the look at me, and he knew that I was a, quite a useful player to have in his squad. So. Um, it was one of those games where it was we were losing and then we came back and it was an amazing day. The, the, it was the journey home was unbelievable because it was just a relief, a sigh of relief. Like we can't be losing and and losing to a team like Charlton at the time. No disrespect, and we're trying to um, challenge for Champions League. It's just not going to rub. So you needed players to come on and make a difference, and that's why I'm always even now when when I was coaching. I was always saying, listen, it's not just about the starting eleven; it's about the team that's on the bench as well. They're the ones that actually count and those are the ones you actually got to make happy uh, for a manager because they're the ones that can change a game on its head if it's going in the wrong direction. So it's really important that we have these type of players always happy in the squad. They know their role, everyone knows their role and everybody's a part of it and the process. And uh, I think um, when you've got a team like that and, and Claudio is really good at um, sorting the team out like that and making sure everybody was happy in that in that space that they could come on to make a difference and these little things that did happen it it, it builds up, builds up to the end of the season and it makes it um all worthwhile when you do get your your, your required goal and hopefully um we actually most of our most of the players that were there we all bonded together um because of these type of moments as well um and we'll all be always be friends we we'll always remember certain times in, in certain games when somebody span it on its head and I was one of that was a moment a pivotal moment in my um, in my Chelsea career With Ida Good Johnson Gianfranco Zola and Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank as well as the as the striking options did you learn any elements from either of them during your time at Chelsea? Look um Jimmy was an out-and-out striker. He could score with his left foot, right foot, the amount of power that he had. I remember doing training sessions with him and he was getting frustrated with me how I struck the ball. Um, and, and he was like, why don't you just strike it cleaner? Why don't you start?" And then I was, I was, I was like, okay, I'm going to try and learn. I'm going to try and learn. But you got to understand that like, he had no backlift and there was nobody in the Premier League that could hit a ball like he could without a backlift. There's only a few players I've seen it. Maybe um, Jermaine Defoe, maybe maybe Ian Wright. Um, but without backlift, he was the best at it. Um, and the shape of his legs, and his, and he had tree trunk fires. Remember, like, it was unbelievable. Yeah. And I was like, I'm just not your build. I can't strike a ball <laughs> like you can. But I was trying. But I, I remember him criticising me, saying, why can't you strike it properly? Strike it. Go for it. Like, this is not how you coach. <laughs> so... Um, so it was um, quite funny um, that I can't, I couldn't strike a ball like him. But then, obviously, to the right of me, then you got Franco Zola um, and and Ida Good Johnson, who are great technicians, and they were taking free kicks. And I was trying the same thing. I was like, I can't do that either. I can't do none of these. What any of these lot can do? That's when I started to think, okay, what do I bring that's different to these guys? Like, because I can't. The only thing that I can take is a little bit of obviously you can strike a ball clean, Jimmy. Um, Ida's great at going to feet and turning 
and um and making things happen so and i would say I, I was a little bit of both i could do a bit of both at the time but i had to get better at it um but no one could do what zola could do because he was just a magician so he was just his own man but um what i did learn from zola was uh, professionalism going to the gym making sure that i looked after myself a little bit better than i was and he was always inviting me to the gym says oh come on let's do, go to the gym straight after training this um, session so i learned that part of him part of um football about um and he taught me a lot on that part but the rest i just took little bits of their game and tried to make it because everyone has an influence in on you whoever you train with whether you like it or not um i used to see frank lampard um after training with a, about 10, 10 a bag of 10 balls in his in in and he puts it on the halfway line gets the ball and he starts he starts sprinting towards the edge of the box and then laces it into an empty goal and all he cares about was getting that on target didn't matter where what part of the goal it went it went in and I, was, I used to see all of this and I was thinking this is this class man this is what um the elite do and just having that um around you at that time was a great influence for me because it was just I was just learning I was just sucking up all the information and um eventually when I came of age I could um get to that get to that um pinnacle of okay I know what it takes to be a professional and I know how to be I know what it takes to be an elite player probably not as elite as those guys but I've got a little bit that will prop me up to get to a level where I'm quite going to be content with Fast forward a little bit to April of 2003. You would go on to score a couple of crucial goals to maintain Chelsea's quest for that fourth Champions League spot. You scored winning goals against Sunderland away, which was a bloody good finish because I remember seeing it just earlier before we did the uh, interview and the game against Bolton, which happened to be my first ever Chelsea game. You certainly had an impact that, that season in terms of scoring goals at crucial times for Chelsea. Yeah, um, that's where I think um, I, I'm probably um, in people's mer memories more because the the goals I, I I remember score I didn't score loads of goals but it was the ones that I scored were quite um, important and it was as I said it was a it was a change in dynamic with what how the game was going so the the Bolton goal was a great goal for me because it was um, it was a long ball over the top and it was like a one on one I've had to. Um, use my strength and get around the goalkeeper and still put it in. I think it was um, UC Yaskalainen I went round mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah. And UC, um, I ended up playing with him later on in my career at West Ham. Uh, what a great guy he was and, um, and is still. And he's a, um, it was just a privilege to play against him and with him because he's such a great person. And um, the other goal, the Sunderland goal, I just came back from a loan move because um, I got put out on a loan move because of my, um, um, I was a naughty boy because I was always coming in late. So um, Claudio Ranieri had enough of me, so he put me out on loan for a month. So I had to go, and then it was only until an injury came up. So I, I think I played like three games or four games for Wolves at the time. And uh, Claudio, Claudio Ranieri said, uh, you need to come back now because there was an injury to one of the boys. Um, I think it was Ida at the time. And so I had to come back in. And yeah, it was uh, it was it was amazing because I didn't expect to be playing. I didn't even know like the week before I was I was I was focusing on another game that I was going to be with without at ball. So when I got called back, I was like, oh, I came back to the training ground. I was in the squad for the next game. Then I was on the bench. Then I ended up coming on scoring, and it was an amazing time because I didn't actually. I think I was supposed to be here. <laughs> then I got a call. I think I remember it was um, either Paul Lintz or someone saying, well done, lad. Um, you've done work really well there. Good luck for the rest of your future. And that was it. So um, it was because Paul Lintz was my, my teammate at Wolves and Dennis mm -hmm. Owen and George and Dar. And I kept in contact with uh, most of them, to be fair. So I, I, I was only there for a month, but um, I had a great experience whilst I was there. So when I did return, um, it made me realise and and how privileged I was to be at a club like Chelsea. So uh, when I came back, I just hit the floor running straight away. Um, and I think we went on to win that game as well because I think we were drawing that at the time. And then the last game of the season at home to Liverpool, it was basically the fourth place decider. Whoever won it would have got it. 
What was the mood like in the dressing room beforehand because of the ramifications of that game, because of the amount of money that would be coming to the winner? What was the mood like? Was it a case of nervousness at the back for, with certain players or did were, to say, too many players that had that experience just focused on the matter at hand? Do, do you know what? Um, when you're when you're a player, when you're a young player, you're just happy to be there, mate. Um, what I did realize was that it was it was. I knew there was something riding on it, obviously, because um, Claudio wouldn't stop talking about it the whole week. <laughs> but he didn't put too much. He didn't put too much pressure on us. Um, he just wanted us to go out there and, um, and and enjoy our game. I can't remember us being really, really put under pressure. It was more to do with. Um, if we do things right, we'll go and win the game. Um, and everyone, everyone knew what we needed to do. We needed, to, and and when you look at that dressing room now, and you look at the like, obviously hindsight, like, we had loads of winners in there, um, and they knew what it took because mentally they had the mental capaci capacity to get to um, getting something out of a game of that magnitude, um, as you went on to see on hindsight, but. I remember um, Jesper Gronkia um, had a worldie of a game. He was unbelievable that game. He was up and down the flanks. He was actually um, unstoppable. And when you got him in that in that mood and such a big game where you needed real men to go and take charge, um, he came up trumps. And I think he scored the only goal of the game. Um, I remember coming on on that game as well. Um, I think me and Franco. And um, I remember... I almost scored. I almost scored that game. It was just I was I was inches away, but um, that would have that would have been. And I always regret because that would have been a great goal, to, a memorable goal for me to score, and to settle the nerves because I think it would have made it two nil at that stage, and it would just been ah, uh, it would have been I'll have been in elation. So it was um, it was a great game. I, one thing I do remember about that game is obviously yes, the magnitude and what we needed and why we needed it. But I just remember what Franco done to Carragher in the corner, <laughs> next to the yes. corner flag. Still oh, being played gosh, now. He made him look. Oh mate, he made him look. I was, I was seeing it live. I was thinking, God damn, that is bad. Like <laughs> he's made him sit on his ass, and he just sat him down. And and the thing about it was, I expected that from a player of his ilk because he just knew when to turn it on, knew when to how to keep the ball, couldn't get the ball off him, and what a player he was. And that's why. Um, for me, he's like one of the best players that I've ever ever um, been a, been around, um, and 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 he just in situations where you needed to take the um, release the gas, he just done that in that moment. And I think everybody realised that we were in control of the game, and it wasn't going to be a back and forth, and we was in control of that game. So when he done that, it just signified where we were and that we were going to win that game in the end. It was Gianfranco's last Chelsea game as well, so very memorable moment indeed. The summer of 2003, do you remember where you was when the news broke and Roman Abramovich took over Chelsea? What was your initial reaction? Um, when Abramovich took over Chelsea, um, my initial reaction was, I don't know what's going on. So I'm only young. Um, I've got a bright future. Um Playing England under twenty ones, really, really doing well, pushing on, kicking on. So I thought I was um, going to be around it, but I didn't know how it would look. Um, but my feeling was, I'm good. Um, I didn't really, have, I wasn't really worried because I was a homegrown player. I was really um, excited for the prospect of working with better players as well, um, and not not to say better players, but players that are are because I knew it was going to buy players and I was willing to learn off other players as well. Um, but I thought I was around the best players already, but I heard there was a, there was another level. <laughs> so um, I was just excited at the time, um, but I didn't know that I was going to be put out on loan. It wasn't, uh, obviously there must have been a conversation around it to say, listen, we can't, do anything with Colton at the moment so we're going to have to go and get him experience because we don't want to scupper his progress because he's really doing well um, what do we do with Colton but whoever made that decision I feel on hindsight right now it was probably the work, the wrong decision to put me out alone for a whole season 
Um, I think I would have developed better if I'd have stayed at the club. But I understand at the time, um, I had to go out on loan because they someone had plans for me in another in another way. So and 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 you you can't write, really write the future, and they they didn't know what was going to happen. But I think I would have been. I think I would have helped the team definitely, but I didn't know what what at what capacity. And that was a bit jarring for me and a bit worrying at the time because when I got back, um, I got sat down and I got told that, yeah, you're going to have to go on loan for a season. Where do you want to go? So I had a few options. And I, stayed, I wanted to stay in London and um, Charlton was like the best option for me at that time. And um, I think because they there was a deal on the t- table um, to ledger me with getting Scott, Scott Parker across as well, um, mm. So I think I was part of that deal to to get him across um, to to West London at the time. So I wasn't really happy with it, but I had to just um, swallow swallow it up and um, and then crack on. And then a year later, you returned from your loan at Charlton, and Jose was there as the coach. You had many new faces there as well, with the a lot of new signings. Did it take you a while to get used to? sort of like the change in management and the change in players in the two years that from w- when you left the club to go out on loan to then when you came back? Yeah, definitely. Um, as a, especially as a young player, like when you see your home changing, um, you're, you're, you're kind of not, not known what is, what to expect. So it was really, um, a difficult moment in my in my life, not just my career, in my life, because I had a lot of adjusting to do. Um, all of a sudden, the culture had changed at the club. Now we're expecting to win instead of um, um, just getting top four. We're expecting to win the league now um, because the dynamics have changed now. So the culture change uh, mentally was really shocking. But the the players that you saw that was up for it really really um really brought it home in the end and the spine in the team was english um and that's where we needed um a lot of a lot of big strong characters at that time um and that's probably what I, it was i was a, probably a bit too um premature for me to be part of that um uh, because i was still learning my trade but i still felt i could give uh, as much as i can but obviously when you've got Roman Abramovich coming in and he wants to splash the money, there's nothing you can do about that. And he's coming in to make an impact. So there was no room for a Colton Cole coming through the ranks, which was a bit disappointing. But I just saw the culture change and it was the training changed. Mourinho was unbelievable, to be fair. He was a very honest person and he told me exactly that he felt that he felt I'd, I'd probably benefit better to go out on loan. Um, and it kind of helped my decision going on loan again because he said if you go on loan you'll come back you'll be part of my squad um, so I was like okay that'll be that's something to look forward to um, so I'd, I'd, I'd done it um, and that's where I felt at that time where I needed probably a little bit extra support because of the season the season before on loan I, w- I weren't really happy um, even though I was in London um, then the second loan I went to Aston Villa um and the thing about it, I just wanted to be home. Every every Chelsea game I was watching on the TV, like I was just making sure how they'd done first because it was my it was my home, you know. And uh, mm. I wanted to really be back there, but I just felt like I was um, segregated away from what I have called home at the time, and it did actually affect affect me as a person and my performances, even on loan, because I just always wanted to get back to where I, where I started and 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 um. As the years went on, I just felt it wasn't going to be how it how I felt it was promised to me. Nothing's promised to you in life, but you've got a picture of how you feel it's going to look at the end. And it just didn't. Um, it was I could see it slipping away from me at that time, which was quite disappointing. You came back in two thousand and five after your second loan spell at Villa. You was vying with Drogba and Crespo for the striking spot. What was that like for you, knowing that, again, a couple of years ago, you was vying with Hasselbank, Good Johnson and Zola. Now you had two other colossals 
as, as strikers in Drogba and Crespo. Was it tough for you to sort of get used to the constant sort of individual battles that you had with them? Or was did you sort of see it as an embracement whereby you was able to learn from them but also compete with them at an equal effort? Um, look, for me, I was still stuck in the space, headspace of being an inferior. Um, and I hadn't got the experience. I don't think my loan moves worked the way I f it should have worked. So I should have come back in a different, um, I should have come back with, in a different headspace, with, willing to like, you know, everything worked out. I went out, scored loads of goals. I went to that team, scored loads of goals. I didn't do that because I wasn't settled. And this leads on to probably what I'm doing today with the loans managing. So I'm a loans manager at West Ham now. And it kind of mirrors what I was missing. So I've made sure how we, how I conduct myself, how I look at things in in the game, and especially the loans department, the things I was missing out alone, which I actually did in the long run affect my life and affected my chances of doing the best I could out whilst I was out alone. Um, when I did return at back to Chelsea at that time, I felt that I hadn't done enough anyway, but it was actually a privilege for me to be around in and around it. And um, and Mourinho kept to his word as well. Jose kept to his word and said, listen, you're going to be around it and um, vie for a spot in this team, which was always going to be hard when you've got world-class strikers ahead of you. Um, the dynamics had changed. Um, and the worst thing about it, I was still stuck in my head. I said, why did you guys get rid of me when you brought in Kesman, who I thought I could have done a better job then? Um, and also uh, Mutu, who we know how that all turned out. Yeah. But he was a good player to mind you. Um, but it was just um it was I just thought I could have still been a part of it. Um but I was I was because I was so immature at the time, I was still stuck in the past, I was still sulking, come back and then I was like, Oh now this is an even bigger challenge. <laughs> How am I gonna get into this team? Um so obviously you've already got Crespo and then you've got DJ Drogba. And you still got Ida Johnson still there because Ida is still a great player. Um, and then myself. So now we were, both of us probably were second fiddle to those two um, at the time because they were so good. Um, and we changed formations as well. So it was, um, it was quite, it was quite a, a remarkable turnaround to see from where I left it to where it was mm -hmm. and how the mindset changed from actually now we're winning leagues now so we've got to look at it in that in that scenario where I was so I wasn't I wouldn't say I was jealous I was just I was I was really um, upset that I wasn't in that first time first in that squad that when we first won the league because I was thinking why am I away from home I feel like I'm in boarding school right now mm. I should be there <laughs> celebrating with the lads I've just been I've just been kicked so I was really um, in my head but her I was I weren't happy about it. So I come back and I seen all of this change and I'm thinking my time's running out. I've only got this amount of time to get in and around um, that first team and really whenever I get my, my chance I have to make an impact. So the pressure was totally different now. I'm a couple of years older than I was when I first came on the scene. So I had to actually apply myself and make sure and um, look I was still in that, that capacity in my head that I wasn't mature enough to take on such a mantle. And and you know what? Mourinho needed men out there to win the league. And and, and he always says it, um, that Chelsea team is the, the team that, that he'll always enjoy it, enjoy it because there was men, he was dealing with men and he didn't wasn't dealing with crybabies. So I learned a lot on how to um, sometimes suppress my own feelings for the betterment of the team. Um, and and try and give my best shot at any time I got when I went out on that field. So it was really a great thing to see, um, and it was a great thing to see firsthand. So I can always um, give my experiences to others that need it nowadays. You scored a crucial goal in essence against Huddersfield in the FA Cup, which was your only goal that season. And then obviously fast forward. We go on to win the league that season, beating Manchester United 3-0 at Stamford Bridge. In terms of yourself, either as a football fan, but also in and amongst it, how bloody good was that team in 05 and 06? Oh, my God. That team was... Um, 
Do you know the Dark team had a little bit of everything? Um, obviously, you got Robin, Damian Duff, Shawright, Phillips, um, Joe Cole. Um, obviously, Lamps in the middle. Then you've got you just had a bit of John Terry at the back, Covalio, Gallas. <laughs> Look how strong that team is. Even when we just figured we had Del Horno, we had um, we had so much good players at the club at that at that time, and it was just amazing to to watch it um, and evolve into some, to something beautiful. Um, Michael Essien was just amazing as well. Uh, these these type of players you get to play with and be around and have have them as friends for life. It was um it was quite a privilege for me to be able to be in sit in a room with these, these guys. Um, I wasn't involved in as much as I wanted to be, um, obviously, but it was it was such a a privilege to be in a, a share the same dressing room with these 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 superstars, basically. That's going on to be Premier League legends, and um, I'm just happy. I was just happy to be in and around it on hindsight now because at the time probably I didn't appreciate it as much because when you're in it, you don't really appreciate things. But when you come out of it and then you listen to people and you see certain aspects, so you see Premier League years on the on the on Sky Sports, and you see, oh well, I was in the round that I was there, I was here. Um, it was it's it's um. It was quite a privilege for me to be in around it and and see it all unfold into being um, such a legend, legendary time and in in Chelsea's history because it was a massive, massive time to be. It was a great time to be a Chelsea fan at that time because we saw everything, what every cover kind of emotions we covered. So yeah, I was um, really privileged to be in that position. In the summer of two thousand and six. You would go on to leave Chelsea to join West Ham on a on a permanent deal. How did this move come about for you? Um, it was I was actually away in um, in in Africa, and um, I got a phone call. But really and truly, before that, I went away. I wanted to play more football, obviously. So I was like, Do you know what? I'll go. I'll, I want to actually go um, somewhere. That's in London. Um, at the time, Spurs came out. Martin Yole fancied me. Cl- Clive Allen at the time as well. They really wanted to work with me and they thought they saw great potential in me. So they was obviously at Spurs. So I went and done my medical over there um, through my agent. And my agent made made, made um, something to say that, um, well, he said, what did he say? He says, oh, apparently you've got to go back to the club. Now you've done this you got to go back to the club and um, Roman Abramovich wants to meet you. Now, I was like, what? The, the real gaffer wants to meet me? What do you want to talk to me about? Like, I'm about to leave. You like They said I could go. And he said, no, he wants to meet you. He wants to meet. So I had to go down the bridge. I had to go into the gym right at the back and um, had a, I had to sit down with him. Him and... Um, um, I forgot his name now. So he's an interpreter at the time, but it's his right-hand man. Um... So me and my, my, my dad was there and my uncle. And we're just sitting there and we're watching. And I was like, he's talking. And then obviously his interpreter is talking and trying to get us to understand what he's saying. And he says, listen, I don't do any business with Spurs. So I don't, this is the re- only reason why I got alerted. But now we're here. Um, I want you to understand that. I think a lot of you, I think you've got great potential. Um but we really want you to go um, to one of my other clubs. And I said, where? And he goes, in Russia. I was like, where? Well, you want me to go all the way to Russia to go kick, kick football? I was like, there's no way I'm going to Russia. Because <laughs> at the time, it was unheard of. Cause, but it wasn't just that it was Russia. It was just the fact that it was out of the league. Um, and I had aspirations of, of playing for England I was of course, like, yeah. through all the ranks and the next stage was playing for the, the English national team yeah. <laughs> so and back in those days if you would have left the country you that you'd have no chance playing for your national team mm. and you just you can kiss your 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 um, caps goodbye basically <laughs> um so I just said I, I had to I had to I said no nah, don't fancy it and I was, he, said, he was like, well, if you do go, make sure, because 
if we do go, I'll definitely give you a contract at the end of this season. So I'll give you an extension, but just go for this one season. And I was like, really? That was enticing. That was actually enticing. So right. it was, but then I looked at it and I was like, well, I'm looking, I'm looking at my other peers. They're all making their debuts for England. They're all close to the first team squad for England. That's what actually swung my, my, my decision to not go. Um, and I felt that I needed to be playing in the Premier League week in, week out for me to stake a claim to be able to be in that conversation for England. Um, and that, that's why, that's what really turned it around for me. Otherwise, I'd probably still be at the club now. <laughs> if I'd <have> said, yeah. <laughs> um, I do like home, but um, it was, that was what actually stopped it. And then, um, and then, Something's happened. So obviously, I said no. I went on holiday. I came back, um, and at that time, I, my, my agent said to me, "Listen, we've got and West Ham here. Um, Alan Pardew wants to talk to you." So I talked to him on the phone. He was he was brilliant. Um, came back, signed straight away, um, and yeah, the rest is history. But um, I didn't really at that time want to leave Chelsea. It was just one of those things that I, I felt. It, it suited both parties at the time because I wasn't going to get any more the amount of game time I was I wanted and obviously on top of that um, I wasn't going to go to Spurs because he wasn't he wouldn't let me so it was just one of those things so I had to West Ham came out for me and uh, yeah I, I've had my best years there and you're still working there now which is which is pretty good What to talk well, about? It just shows you that I'm a, I'm, it just shows you I'm a homebody, really, doesn't it? Um, so I do like home. Um, I made a home at West Ham, um, and and I'm the, one of their favourite adop- adopted sons. Um, <laughs> and it's hard to do say that when you're a Chelsea man, um, but it is what it is. At the end of the day, Chelsea made you. There you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> To want to talk about football of today before before we do eventually let you go. And one aspect of football that people still get rolled with, and people some people I speak to still don't want it to be part of football is VAR. Carlton, I've spoken to all me guests about VAR. Some of them are keen on it. Some of them don't want it at all. What's your take on the technology? Um, for for me, um, VAR is. It's a good tool. Um, it's, it's if it's used correctly. Uh, um, I think we were overdoing the VAR system the last couple of years. We're just we let we was letting it ref us instead of us using it to ref the game. Um, and 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 that's what the bottom line. As long as the ref wants to use it as a tool to to improve his vision on how he sees. A decision going, then that's okay with me. But if he's just relying on it and he's governed by the technology, that is going to be an issue. I don't mind. Um, I don't mind human mistakes. It's okay. The problem is, is that when you're owned by these big, big clubs now, um, and the people's invested a lot of money in it, so they want. The, the, so they, don't, they don't want it to go down to human mistakes. <laughs> yeah. They want it all um, computerized. They want yeah. it all facts and figures. They want it all black and white. And that is the big problem we have. As the game's grown, the people that actually have the money that's investing in these football clubs don't want to leave it down to human mistake. They want it to be done properly. But that is where it is wrong because now you've got to look at it because you saw the game in a way. That's when you got when you love this game. That's why these, these people don't love the game. You saw the beauty of the game, whether it was um, a mistake by the referee or it was favoritism by the referee. There's a beauty in it to make it football. And when you start looking at it from a computerized background, like FIFA. Now I look like I look at some of the games now. I just think I'm playing FIFA. All I need is a control pad in my hand. Yeah. Uh, that's when I'm looking at a, t- t- a yeah. game now because everything's robotic 
everything is you, the, the sense of um, celebration even when you score a goal you're not sure and the suspense there's no need for all of that <laughs> if the referee wants to bring it back he brings it back like, but the referee has to be given the more of the power again and once we get that you can work, we can work with technology it's not a problem but don't rely on it and don't make sh- make the make the um, call the VAR have the last call that's the main thing VAR can't rule judgment over your call. It can advise, it can advise you, but you still have to not be as influenced as they have been. These referees, they've they've been doing, they've been um, being lazy. It's made them lazy, and they, they don't want to take the buck. They want to take the the blame, um, and that's why they get paid paid big money because they have to take the blame sometimes. You get well compensated for it. Talk about um, Chelsea of, of today, and it's obviously a little bit of a transformation in terms of new manager yet again, but obviously new players and obviously a new a new style has has come into Chelsea. What have you made of Chelsea of, of 2024? Um, have, have, you, have you seen, obviously, with your TV exposure as well as a, as a pundit, You've seen quite a few Chelsea matches. What's been your take of Enzo Maresca and this young Chelsea team now? My take has been um, that Enzo has done a fantastic and stellar job. Um, you've got to understand where he, what he had to do with such a massive, massive squad. I think he had about forty players, first team players that he had to he had to kind of shift about and make. And upset a few people, and ups, upset upset the fans as well. Um, he's had to be at the butt. He had the he had to be at the spearhead of all of that. And then I'm looking at it, and I think, do you know what? Now they're actually playing some great football. Obviously, the other night wasn't great, <laughs> but um, <laughs> he's playing some. He's, he's he's playing some great football, and most of those boys that are playing. Um, are buying into the Maresca way and how he wants to go about his work. And it looks like to me, because obviously I follow Chelsea on Instagram and, and see what they post and some of the players, they look like they've got a great team bonding there. Um, and it was at risk, especially with a few a bit with a few um, outside noise. But I think what he's done, he's um, said, listen, forget all of that. All these people can talk, the pundits, the Colton Coles, the Joe Coles, the everyone, all of us can talk. Don't listen to them. This is us. This is our family here. Hmm. You in this room is all that matters. This is how I think I can make you a better player. This is how I can make you think that you're a better team and forget the outside noise. Now, he's done that and his tactics have, have been good. Sometimes he's been he's been unlucky some games as well where I think he could have got more out of the game, but it looks like to me, judging from the last two or three years at Chelsea, that he's got them singing from the same hymn sheet now, and everybody is on the same page, and all these boys are wanting to do really well for the club, and that's where you want Chelsea. That's that's a great start to his Mariska to his career. So hopefully he can start building and doing better and start to win some. I said. I said last season, I said playing in the Conference League, because I remember West Ham was in the Conference League mm-hmm. and they went on to win it. I think, I was like, you got to do, because they're starting again, it's a new era. Um, Bowley's come in, he's, he's, he's tried a few things, hasn't worked, um, but now it looks like he's on the right path now. So, I said, Winning the Conference League for Chelsea would give a team bonding that you need and you haven't had for quite a while. I know it's a lesser competition for like the likes of Chelsea, but just having a nice cup run, just having something to sing about, the fans to go to a new to go to a, a European game and not expect to get beat to be the to the and and then if you do go and win that whole competition, it brings it brings a bond that you can't break. And those young, remember, those young players need that. They've they've had to deal with so much pressure and so much living up to. Like Everyone's always comparing them to the yesteryear, you know? And it's not fair. These boys are not coming there for that. 
They've come in to make a name for themselves at a big club, club like Chelsea. And Tom Bowley's been the one that's been championing them, saying, yeah, we are right by picking these players. And there's a lot of people with, in the outside that always criticise as soon as it goes wrong. I just knew as soon as they're in a competition like this, it's going to galvanise the team. These young players need... They, some of these boys have never won anything. So yeah, that's true. They, they have to get a new... They've they've got they've got to, to get a new um, understanding of how to win together and and not be selfish and do it as a team and you're going to see it now and hopefully they enjoy this this period in the, the European competitions as such because I reckon they could always go on to the big and better thing because the next stage will be Europa League after that then the Champions League then now we'll go in somewhere now now there's a team there worth I'm um, shouting from the rooftops about so. Um, it's a build. It's a. It's, everything's in progress, and it looks like to me that they're on the right direction. Carlton, last question from me: How do you look back on your time at Chelsea Football Club? I look at my time at Chelsea Football Club as a great start. It was a great start. And I'm so grateful to um, Chelsea to giving me that that start in my life. Um, circumstances changed the path of where I felt my destiny lied. Um, but then the life choices and the life changes that um, that came towards my my life and the way I see. Um, and what I learned and how I've used what Chelsea has taught me to to better myself in today's life and in in the different world I'm in now um, was unbelievable and I'll always be happy to always do anything Chelsea because that's part of my history that's part of my life and that's part of where I grew up and I'll never ever forget as they say you never ever forget your roots and that's definitely one thing I've got to say about Chelsea I'll never forget my roots although um, the sections of the crowd when I did return call me uh, Chelsea rejects. And, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't take it too personally, but it did hurt at the time because I was thinking, I'm Chelsea, I'm, I am Chelsea. What are you talking about? <laughs> I've never been rejected. It's just, it's just the um, circumstances. But um, that's where we are. I'm, I, I do whole family knows that as well. So that's it's just the way it is. And I, and I say to my sons as well um, that. If it wasn't for Chelsea, you wouldn't be here. So that's how life goes. Carlton, I've enjoyed it. I think our listeners are going to enjoy it. Thank you so much for being on the show. Hopefully we'll see you back down at the bridge quite soon if you're not enticed with the West Ham and their ground. But <laughs> hey, listen, enjoy your time, obviously, as the loans manager at West Ham, and hopefully we will uh, cross paths soon. Yeah, definitely. Take care. Thank you for having me.